ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Michael Kimmelman and guest Anthony Fox. Want me to sit over so, there? Uh, no, we're just gonna we're gonna pretend that these seats are, are filled. We'll, we'll be joined later uh, by a few others. Um, so, Secretary Fox, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you. Um, okay, so we all know the basics, right? We know that um, interest rates are low, and investment in infrastructure, the returns are very high. Um, we know the administration has limited influence over Congress, and. Uh, and we know that um, Americans rely on an infrastructure from the Eisenhower administration. So let's talk about what you can practically get done. And maybe we can also focus specifically on some of the projects uh, in this area as well that the federal government can, uh, in, can influence. So let's begin with something that's been on my mind and, and maybe the minds of some people in this room, which is the Gateway uh, proposal for, uh, uh, for the Eastern Seaboard and, and Amtrak. Well, it's perhaps one of the, if not the most important project in the country right now that's not happening. Um, uh, it's really emblematic of, of where we are right now as a country. This is uh, some tunnels that run between New York and New Jersey. Um, they carry, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people on a weekly basis. And it's, 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 almost, it's almost criminal that we're not getting those bridges fixed right now um, because we know they have a short shelf life. Uh, well, we have these two existing years. passenger tunnels which yeah. are, which are yeah. on the ropes and we know from Sandy, yeah. of course, that they were. So th there's been a plan around for a long time to yeah. build new tunnels. Um, Ten years ago, uh, Governor, I'm sorry, several years ago, well, in 2010, yeah. uh, five years ago, uh, Governor Christie nixed a plan called ARC, which was an earlier manifestation of this. So what, what breaks this logjam? Are we, are we going to be a country that's constantly waiting for some catastrophe? Yesterday, Penn Station was shut down for hours by a delayed train. We're, we, let me tell you, I am willing, and I've told my team this, that we will be willing to convene the major leaders of this region to try to get on the same page and get something moving. But I gotta be honest with you, if the states aren't willing to jump into this and the various authorities that have to play a role, uh, I can't push rope, but I will do everything I can with the time I have in this office to make this project happen, but I need the folks around this region well, what, to what cooperate. Can, what can you do to compel yeah. them? What's, what's the role of the federal government in trying to, well, to force the issue? Look, we, we, uh, we have, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say we have many sticks, uh, but we have lots of carrots. And one of the carrots we have is uh, the ability to uh, help loan resources to get the project done, hopefully on an accelerated basis, but again, uh, we're, we're happy and we will convene uh, New York, New Jersey and the associated entities to see how much progress we can make. But this, has, this is a leadership issue in the region and I can only do what the region's willing to do. Yeah, well, okay, so, but in terms of regional, look, <coughs> an interstate rail system, yeah. um, a high-speed rail, uh, you know, if you, if you use the interstate highway system as a precedent, maybe it would cost two, three hundred billion dollars. That's a fraction of President Obama's 2010 stimulus package, but we can imagine that's the kind of stimulus that would produce incredible numbers of jobs, sure. uh, lower the national carbon footprint, uh, do all sorts of good things, increase competitiveness. Everyone can kind of say this is a good thing. Um, that, that involves regional cooperation, interstate uh, cooperation. Um, the federal government must have some leverage to bring people together or to uh, make the case that it's going to work. What, what about the precedents in California or Texas? Well, uh, look, I'm, I'm just telling you the, the way things work uh, with our transportation system is that 
in many cases, the decisions about transit systems are local and regional, and the decisions about highway systems are largely state. We put a lot of money into these systems, but you'd actually be surprised how few, um, how few uh, sticks the federal government has left itself in terms of pushing things to happen. Having said that, um, if, as I suspect, it is likely to happen over the next uh, several years, this ratchets up as a safety issue, mm -hmm. uh, that may be a place where the federal government can play a role. But I, frankly, I don't want us to get there. I don't think it's worth waiting. We have, we have to deal with this right now. Yeah, I mean, I think about Penn Station in yep. New York City, and it's not just a terrible place, but it's, it's an unsafe place. It's a safe mm -hmm. place in which you, know, you don't ha even have really the kinds of modern means of egress. And it's, it's a place waiting, I'm sorry to say, for, for disaster. This is no way to run a city or a country. It's emblematic of what's happening around the country. Um, we have every year $15 billion shortfall in the highway trust fund. Uh, Congress has been trying to backfill it every single year with uh, duct tape and chewing gum, I say. And it's not a way for state and local governments to really plan. And so, you know, part of the problem with big projects like Gateway, uh, as well as just having local support, is the fact that the federal government has not sent a strong signal through its resource allocation that projects like that need to get done and get done now. But, you, but you're saying that for a project like Gateway, the federal mm -hmm. government would be there. I am going to be there. I mean, one of the yeah. problems, I think, for Governor Christie the last time around was he felt that New Jersey was bearing uh, a large portion of the burden. And he said that if the plan went over budget, which has happened on infrastructure projects, I can't, nothing comes to mind, but I know it has happened, <laughs> that uh, he would be left holding the bag. And I assume part of what you're saying is the gov federal government will be there to make sure that's not the, the hindrance. I don't think outcome. this deal will happen without the federal government playing some role and uh, both financial and urging the, the communities to come together. And so uh, we will be there in every way we can be, but again, if the states aren't willing to jump in and try to figure this out now, it's gonna uh, be hard for us to do something. So generationally, things are changing. We, we, uh, in real dollars, the gas tax has barely increased relative to the maintenance cost of our bridges, tunnels, and highways. But we have generation of people who moving into cities, many of them are not buying cars, they want public transit, the whole kind of balance of uh, transportation priorities is changing, but our system isn't changing with it. How can, we, how can we change that around to meet these changing demands? Well, let me, let me begin by giving you a worldview of transportation that I come to it with, which is that uh, transportation is more than throughput. It's more than getting from A to B. And we see many examples in our history and some right here in the city where the placement of infrastructure has actually driven uh, almost a catalytic economic impact on the areas that surround it. We also have too many examples around the country where infrastructure has done the opposite, uh, that literally the construction of a bridge or an overpass has closed in places and locked them out of opportunity. And I really appreciate your writing on this topic because as the country continues to struggle to get more people into the middle class and to hold people who want to stay in the middle class there, I think design is a very important piece of how cities and communities are going to have to deal with this issue going forward, even beyond the throughput issues. Yeah, I mean, obviously in New York City, but in other cities as well, we're kind of trying to reclaim infrastructure, not just the High Line, but reclaim waterfronts, mm -hmm. Brooklyn Bridge Park, and this is true across the country. Um, to see infrastructure not just as something that could be recycled, but maybe that could be built from the start with multiple purposes, Yes, um, which is not obviously the attitude uh, we used to have. On the other hand, we're, we're dealing with that legacy because so little has changed mm -hmm. since the 1950s and 60s. Our policies have not changed to reflect that. Right, right. Well, this is a pretty bleak picture we're painting. While we're on it, <laughs> while, we're, while we're dwelling in bleakness, let, let me ask you about, yeah, let me ask you, well, you need a drink, right? Yeah, After right, all exactly. This. Yeah. yeah, I understand. Sure. Let me ask you about New York City's airports, which are 
Um, so I think you once, <laughs> you once said that the, the air traffic control system is something from the Kennedy administration, or so, I mean something yeah. from, or post-World War II. Yeah, World War II radar. Yeah. yeah. World War II <laughs> radar. Okay. Remember the guy in MASH with the helmet and the flaps? Yeah. That's still how it works? Yeah, pretty much. That's comforting. Yeah. So, so what can we do to fix New York City's airports? Well, we've get, we need to modernize our airports. Um, you know, I don't have to tell you all this. Uh, LaGuardia, uh, just to use that as an example, is, is the first place many people see of America. And uh, it is not a pretty picture. Um, I think the vice president has, has uh, commented on this ad nauseum. But the question is, what do we do about it? And I think you've got some energy behind um, doing a public-private partnership to uh, really um, not only dress up LaGuardia, but to begin to think about our airport systems in a more modern fashion. As we're doing sort of the, uh, uh, the uh, cosmetic work on an airport like LaGuardia, we're working very hard at USDOT to update our avionics systems mm -hmm. so that our air traffic systems are world-class GPS-based systems. Um, this is going to create more efficiency in the airstream. Uh, it's going to save, hopefully, not only airlines money, but hopefully customers money uh, because they'll use less fuel and be able to move more efficiently. And so these are some of the things we're doing to try to modernize the system. Well, obviously, you mentioned a public-private venture there to, to create a new terminal, a modernized terminal. Um, if, I, if I can, let, let me bring out some of the other panelists sure. who will address some of the uh, public-private issues. So uh, let me call out, if I can, uh, uh, Jeanette Sadik Khan from Bloomberg and David Pluff from Uber and Terry Deo of uh, Meridian. So thank you all for coming. We're going to, you, you get the, the picture. We're going to fix it now. <laughs> so I'll begin with you, Mr. Pluff, because uh, I was watching this morning uh, something called Element Animation. It's a, it's a, it's a YouTube channel with my eight-year-old. Um, and the ad came on for um, Uber. Or I should say, the ad came on uh, about the de Blasio administration and, and Uber. My eight-year-old sat there eating his cereal, looking at these people who were really unhappy. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, you're really obviously uh, campaigning hard to, uh, to uh, persuade the public here in New York uh, of, of Uber. Explain a little bit about the campaign, and, and I mean that specifically, how much, how much money are you pouring into this, and what's the effort? Right. Well, it's hard to intrude on your morning YouTube. <laughs> you never know when you can reach people. You're everywhere now. Um, yeah. the, I mean, the truth is we don't really have to persuade people here in New York. I mean, they've spoken. I mean, we, we have, uh, you know, well over a million active riders here just in the city. Um, the big story about Uber is um, addressing transportation, deserts, places where people had a hard time getting around. It's easy to get a cab uh, here uh, today, tomorrow, next year. Uh, but the outer boroughs, you know, right now if you press a button, the car's there in three minutes. No discrimination. It's the same transportation opportunities that anyone else in the Upper West Side can get. So I think our issue is really with, with, with some of the politicians here who want to uh, cap Uber and Lyft, which would turn it essentially into a taxi medallion system, which hasn't worked out so well. So there's obviously a lot of issues around um, what's the best way to provide service to those with disabilities. Uh, what's, you know, we're fully regulated here. We're regulated by the Tax and Limousine Commission. It's actually our most regulated market in the United States of America. So how many cars are being added, do you think, by Uber? Uh a month. Well, our estimate is over the next year to meet demand, there would be 10,000 drivers. Uh -huh. now, again, uh, Uber is unlike, a lot of these are not professional drivers. They're driving 10, 12 hours a week. That's our sort of most, uh, I think, uh, the use case is people, usually they or their spouse have other job, they're driving for a period of time in their own personal car, their Toyota Prius, uh, you know, their Ford Fusion. And that's to meet demand. And, you know, we have uh, every week 25,000 people signing up here in New York. Uh, and again, every week those numbers get bigger and bigger in the outer boroughs. That's where the real growth is. I mean, I think there's a misperception that Uber and Taxi and Lyft were, were competing for one stagnant market. The market's exploding. And when you make it easy for people not to drive their own car, 
they'll choose to do that. Yeah, but Ultimately, not, that does help reduce right, congestion. But they're not doing that yet. And now we have more cars on the street for, for the time being. And the, you know, we're trying to think about new forms of mobility. Maybe, Jeanette, you can speak to this. I mean, there's, a, there's definitely a discord at the moment between the growth of traffic in the streets and cars and what has been an effort towards changing mobility. Let me just let Jeanette uh, Yeah, no, I think, uh, first of all, I mean, I think everybody knows what the debate is out here. I mean, I don't think that if you take a look at what's the future of transportation, uh, I don't think people look at the yellow cab industry and say, you know, this 1930s model of transportation is the future. You know, I mean, I think people sort of see Uber as a really significant part of the future. Um, but I do think that, you know, as we're looking forward, we're going to see a lot more, uh, mu much less raising your hand, you know, to get a cab or, or a car service, and much more information in your hand. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there are a lot of questions about how do we ensure that this service is right and that it's working within the fabric of our overall transportation network. And so I think that it's not an issue of, you know, should we or shouldn't we? I think a big question is about how do we ensure that technology and car services fit well into the overall fabric of our transportation network? You know, because I don't think it's just about uh, a smartphone, um, I think it's, or a smart car. I think you really have to look at what we're doing on our streets and really prioritizing our streets for public transport, <coughs> for biking, for better walking, so that we really have a really effective mix on our streets. Right, so, so, so the two of you, and, and Terry, you can leap in if you wish as part of, I mean, this is, this is a really classic case of this question of, uh, that we see now cities increasingly facing as we talk more about the need for private enterprise to pick up where the government has left off to this, this conflict between entrepreneurship and then government regulation, the need for, so I mean, let me ask you, do, are there any limitations? To the, what, where should the government be able to say, this is how we regulate our own streets? Right, well, we are fully regulated here and over 50 states and cities have passed new laws in the last six months in the US alone. What does that do? That enshrines in law background check and safety regimes, insurance regimes, vehicle inspection. So we are fully regulated. And in terms of congestion, the average car is used in the United States 4% of the time. It's the most utilized, underutilized asset uh, in all of our lives. And what happens with ride sharing is instead of one person driving the car into the city and it par is sitting in a parking lot, you have multiple people using the car. And the big idea behind this is when you do carpooling on scale which we're doing in New York and through other cities, which is it's not just you ordering an Uber, it's two people getting in the same car who are roughly going to the same destination. And given the population explosion we're gonna see in urban areas, I mean, New York's gonna reach nine million people in the next few years. You're not gonna build new subway lines or at scale. You're not gonna have room for more roads. You're no, gonna you have to reduce car utilization. Right. And but we're just can, part you, of the solution. You can use your streets more efficiently and more effectively, and I think that's really what the issue is. It's also, it's not only the technology, but it's about the hardcore yeah. infrastructure on the ground and making sure, I mean, cities certainly uh, should be managing that infrastructure, right? They pay right. tax, New York City taxpayers pay for road maintenance. You know, residents live on these streets. And so I think it's a really fundamental question about what are we doing with the fabric of our transportation network. It's not just one right. thing. The future is gonna have Uber and taxi cabs and lots of different transportation right. services. So I think providing transparency and you know, data that we can all use together to figure out a, this shared mobility, a package, Helsinki does this. They look at transportation as a, uh, as a service. And so you buy bundled right. transportation. You can get car share, Uber, right. vans, buses, bikes, all together on a coordinated payment platform. But it's really important, I think, to understand what's happening on the streets. I've, and I'm so that data piece, I think, is really I'm key for I'm seeing. in complete agreement with this. But so, on, so, so let, Uber and Lyft right now are less than 1% of the vehicles in the city. Two and a half million come in a day. So what are we, the speed limit was reduced from 30 to 25. The data that's being cited is between 2010 and 2014 that we've reduced speeds by a half mile. The speed limit was reduced. That was in the teeth of the recession. Speeds were down everywhere. You've got delivery trucks. You've got pedestrian pathways. You've got bikes. The point is you have to look at the entire set of issues Agreed. and say what is causing uh, a potential issue rather than single out one small sector so, and say we're going to act before we have the facts. So you're for congestion pricing, I assume? 
Yeah, we think that makes sense. That's what they do in London and, and other cities. And, and I'm going to ask you about that in one second, but before I do, and if you, if you are for congestion pricing, are you also willing to hand over data that you have from the company to the city in order to do congestion pricing? Well, we, we are eager to share data that does not jeopardize individual rider privacy. But yeah, we're already doing this in the city of Boston. We're in discussions with a lot of cities because obviously a lot of people are using our platform to move around cities. You can learn a lot and cities can then make decisions based on that. So Terry, right. congestion right. pricing. Most of the data that he's talking about are actually already available from uh, mobile phone companies. So it, it's not really something that is difficult to share. But I, I do share the vision that the next services in transportation, we don't know what they are. And we're talking about mobility in general. So mobility also includes you know, staying at home and working online. That's mm -hmm. part of the offer. Uh, and, and making it inclusive. I think uh, I like your point about making it accessible for people in the suburbs to be able to get to a job or, or, or not. So what is missing in that is the underlying infrastructure going with the services because it's not only roads, maybe rail, it may be other things. Mm -hmm. But if you don't invest and plan as a whole uh, these type of infrastructure, to go along with this, then you get into these issues about we have two more cars on the roads, perhaps because the roads are too small, and perhaps because we never I'm thought about sure increasing the roads. The roads are too small. <laughs> no, I haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> no, no, but clearly there are issues in the underlying infrastructure, and there's not on, only one model way of looking at transportation. There are multiple ways, and that needs to be looked at from an overall uh, perspective. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Secretary. Well, I'll just say, I, I think, picking up on this point, that you know, every community is going to have its own uh, design challenges, its own in interest in, in charting its own future. But I think one of the things that I want to come back to is the fact that we do have opportunity gaps in this country that are in some ways embedded in the design of our systems. And I don't think we're going to be able to solve all of these problems with throughput. I think some attention needs to be placed on the planning and the design work. And I think that's what's so troubling about the lack of long-term funding certainty at the federal level is that the planning and the design processes are grinding to a halt at the very time when the country needs to be taking dramatic steps forward. So I see transportation as playing a very critical role in reformulating the fabric of our country economically and creating more places that are good places to go and good places to live. Yeah, Jeanette. I would just um, push back slightly on that because I do think that cities and mayors around the country are actually going, taking the lead in this short term, medium term, and longer term planning. Because, you know, with the lack of, you know, a really big federal vision. Um, on it, on what that future is about. I think cities don't have a choice but to take a look at what those needs are. You know, you saw that with Mayor Bloomberg's Plan YC uh, proposal, long-term sustainability plan, which changed how we organized our transportation uh, at the street level from the ground up. And you saw Mayor de Blasio building on that with one uh, YC. And so I think you're seeing mayors actually really get into the scrum of what they need to do to ensure that they continue to grow and thrive in the years ahead. And they're investing in transit, and they're investing in safer streets, and they're investing in high quality uh, environments. And they're looking at the transportation mix, which needs to include new technology services like Uber and Lyft uh, and others. But we do need to do it in a comprehensive way so that it's not just this one-off little discrete service that's looked at in isolation away from the other package of services. Now let me ask you one question along those lines, which we've talked about, and then yeah. I'll let you respond. Sure. I mean, uh, you introduced bike share here with the city, and um, I know that the process of getting money for, for bike share from the federal government goes through this very convoluted, you have to get state approval, things take forever. Mm -hmm. Is there any way, Mr. Secretary, that, that that can be streamlined? Why can't money go directly to Jeanette? <laughs> and the cities and uh, <laughs> let, let them do what they think they want to do without so, having to wait. So the reason why is because we basically haven't, we haven't reconsidered federal transportation policy on our surface system since 1956. Uh, we've added transit into the trust fund, but really the, the way that money flows in the federal system is basically the same as it was in 1956, and we know that the country is in a much more um, fluid place in terms of local governments, and I agree with what, uh, what you've said, 
I was actually a mayor before I was doing this job, and I was actually doing some of the things you're talking about. But I think the problem is, is that mayors are working around design flaws that they can't fix on their own. And, and I think that, you know, when you look at Rochester, which is now burying a freeway, Columbus, Ohio, which is capping a freeway, uh, there are solutions that are starting to come online, but it does take alignment at the federal, state, and local levels. It does take resources, and it does take the courage to rethink how we design for inclusion in the 21st which century. Which the federal government doesn't have at the moment. Well, the secretary has it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, so Terry, I don't yeah. see why, why opposing sort of a federal with the, it's normal that the mayor lead because it's, it's within the communities. Uh, and in fact, when, as investors, if you think about sustainability, part of it is having the communities engage and really building their own infrastructure, their own project, and their own service offer. Uh, because if you have it parachuted from somewhere else, I think it's, it's a little bit more difficult and it's difficult to sustain over the long term. Because when we talk about mobility, we're also talking about affordability. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and efficiency, uh, and, and that uh, without sort of over-advocating the influence that private sector can bring into this public-private partnership, they are a great opportunity to go further on that. They're not a magic wand. I mean, the pensioners, the millions of U.S. pensioners that I represent, they love to invest in roads, transit, and things that exist and that they can touch and they can see but they also want a long-term return, which may be reasonable because they're a long-term investor. Mm -hmm. So all those questions of affordability cannot be discussed without the communities, and the mayor is best placed uh, very often, but the yeah. federal system has been helpful. I mean, uh, uh, just to give a couple examples yeah. of congestion uh, reduction in the Dallas area, Dallas Walford area, we've been investing, putting those managed lanes where people can actually use them the TFIA program was instrumental in making this possible, uh, which is a, a program from the federal uh, government on yep. DOT. And without this program, most of these sort of large projects where you really have to build new infrastructure to alleviate congestion would be impossible. So there are two roles there that are complementary, but I don't think one needs to take the lead over the other. So help me both, maybe both of you. I mean, it seems that everybody agrees that, that some kind of private uh, entrepreneurial investment is critical and, and important for cities and the, and the country in the future. Nobody disagrees with this. So let me ask you, Terry and David as well, I mean, what are, talk, let's talk, because so many times people say this as if this is the magic wand that's gonna solve the problems of uh, funding at a federal level. So let me ask you specifically, and what are the limitations of private public partnership? I think the, the limitations are in the three Ps. I mean, we're talking public, private, and, and partnerships, and the three words are, <laughs> are, are very, very uh, interesting, because there's a historical sort of suspicion between those two worlds, uh, in particular in relation to transportation uh, in, in this country. So we have to go beyond that. But what does it take to get beyond that? Uh, first of all, what I should say is there is probably more money from the pension funds here than there are projects where we could put it in. So huh. there's not a lack of flow or cash or uh, investment from the private sector size, but there's a lack of projects. And there's a lack of projects because the public sector often is not quite yet organized and has the capacity to actually plan, design, procure project, whichever way they want to go about it, uh, it's very difficult to find a very good project director in any DOT mm -hmm. in this country that can actually handle a public-private partnership on a plain level basis, because partnership means that you have to discuss a sequel. Mm -hmm. So if you don't discuss a sequel, then you have a, a number of chances where this will fail, and this is where it's not a magic one. Does that make sense to you, Jeanette, as well? Yeah, no, I think I do think that one of the institutional obstacles is the fact that on the government side, you don't have the same sophistication as you do on the, on the private market side. I think there's no question about that. I do think that there are really interesting opportunities that you're seeing at the city level. Um, you mentioned bike share. You know, we had $50 million raised for private sector sponsors, Citibank and, and MasterCard, to pay for the first new transportation system in 60 years. I think there are really interesting opportunities to do that, you know, creating hotspots, bringing in some of the you know, Verizon players and internet players to be able to 
sort of uh, cobble on to, you know, clamp on to some of our existing infrastructure and use those revenue streams to actually continue to pay for uh, new services, uh, critical transportation services. I think Ubers are really interesting mm -hmm. uh, and some of the new companies that are coming in here too and looking at them as an opportunity uh, to add to the transportation mix to help finance, to help cities deliver their sustainability, <laughs> mobility, right, yeah. economic goals. But again, it needs to be done in a way that is, is uh, supportive of public transit that doesn't, you know, double down on the congestion that we're just kind of starting to, to get ourselves out of, that it is part of a series of mobility options, options and yeah. choices. And I think that's, that's a real part of the secret mm -hmm. sauce. Right, right. And I, I think, you know, and so you, you've got to look for good opportunities. So we work with some transit agencies here in the U.S. where we become a last mile solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there's a big use case for Uber and presumably for Lyft where people take a subway or metro, they get to the last stop. If they know between the second to last stop and the last stop they can order a car, it'll be there. They're more inclined to use the service. So we can be part of how do you solve a solution like that. I do, the Secretary Fox talked about this. I think this is very important. The New York Times actually had a, I think about a month ago, um, uh, another study that talked about the direct link between people being trapped in poverty and the lack of reliable transportation options. I know this from my old political life, okay? When, when, you, when, you, when you talk to people about how they're living their lives when they're economically struggling, obviously lack of money uh, is with them every second of every day, but so is lack of time mm -hmm. in a way most of them in this room could never understand. Yep. And so when you can say, now you can get someplace a little bit easier, like maybe to the last subway stop, and it saves you 30 minutes and a few dollars, that is enormous to them. It means they spend 30 minutes with reading to their child. It means maybe they can get to the coding class. Mm -hmm. It opens up a whole opportunity. So I think all of us need to think through that. How do we bring that kind of equality? Because it's not just, can I get to the restaurant easier? It's, can I actually move around my city in a way that saves me a little bit of money and a little bit of time? And, and for them, that's a game changer. Right? In, in addition to that, I think there's a budget issue. I mean, when you're in the poor suburbs, uh, transportation budget is part of your monthly budget. So whatever money you can save, and time is kind of money in that case, uh, is very important in terms of what else you can afford. And that's why long-term affordability is a critical issue. And, and you know, it's, I, I agree with what you were saying, but at the end of the day, the lead should be coming from policy, and policy needs to talk to constituency and decide and make those choices. The private sector can help think about it, uh, they, it shouldn't be them making those choices. These are important choices for the future in terms of whether you want, you know, low carbon uh, transport system. Or these are choices that people should make uh, and people through their representative can, at city council. Can I just raise one example and then I, I want to turn to you. I, it's something I've been talking to Jeanette about recently because it had to do with the bus rapid transit system in New York, which was another initiative that Jeanette was involved in. What's very interesting there is you have a subway system that here in New York City, which was designed to funnel people into the Manhattan core. The commuting patterns have changed. The rising economic values around subway stations are pushing people to areas which are not served by subways, so they're reliant more on buses because they can't also necessarily afford. We don't have carpooling yet of the sort you're describing. So the bus system needs to be upgraded. These are the people who can least afford delays to get to work, who have the longest commutes. It's very much along economic and racial lines. So as I understand this conflict, though, in order to institute these uh, rapid bus lanes, one needs to take over parts of the street, to dedicate space to bus lanes, to lose some parking spots. It's a conflict between car space and bus space. It seems to me that's an equity issue. Um, and it's also one that's very hard to resolve in a, in a situation like New York. So I lay it out there before you. What, how, so here's a situation where we're talking about transit is absolutely critical to equity mm -hmm. and, and public transit, and, and we already see potentially a you know, conflict between private enterprise and, and public needs, community interests co combating cars and, and public transit. Yeah. I, mean, I think you, you have two issues that come out of that. First of all, any projects like this will not survive without a very good consultation. And it may take time, but unless you get buy-in from the people around, uh, you're not gonna do it against them. So there's no, everybody who's tried has failed, so there's no point trying without a real good public consultation on this type of thing. The, the, the second issue is a question of affordability that I was mentioning. Uh, you, probably cannot afford to increase the bus ticket 
uh, price. And you have to raise the question about you know, how much the city and the taxpayers are willing to actually put to increase that infrastructure and that flow to make sure that um, these people coming from, from far away can commute uh, in a faster way and hope to get it back on the sort of economic development that is coming from it. So these are fundamental policy issues that unless you solve those first, which I think they are solvable, it's just mm -hmm. a question of laying down the cards on the table and discussing it, um, you, you won't go further. You know, so when I was a mayor, uh, my city design team came to me and said, uh, we're gonna take a four lane street that is very busy, very congested, and we're gonna move it down to three lanes and we're gonna move more traffic through it. And I said, that's crazy, how in the world can you do that? Well, it turns out that a lot of people were using those middle two lanes to make turns. And we made that middle lane a turn lane and the other lanes were for throughput. We added bike lanes and pedestrian facilities and we got more traffic through it. I, you know, I think, and what that story tells me is that when you're able to explain to people how this is good for them, you know, the folks who can't park on the street because you've taken that lane out, but who nevertheless will find some ease of movement that'll be better than what they have, I think the whole story has to be told here because what Americans are really looking for, they're not looking for the same uh, crummy commute they have today. They're looking for something that's gonna be better. And I think the more we can do to tell that story about how design can improve, um, the better off we're going to be as a country. I think that story was told in New York City um, mm -hmm. over the last several years in terms of just exactly what the Secretary is talking about, which is realigning you know, your streets to be much more efficient and much more effective. Uh, we can go after this to First Avenue and see exactly that treatment where we've got a protected bike lane, three lanes of moving traffic, dedicated turn lanes, and a dedicated select bus service line, which has improved the mobility for everybody on the corridor. So I think that that is a, a really important way of getting beyond the status quo of how we look at our streets. Our streets are not just designed for cars. They need to be treated as a valuable real estate that they are. And if you do that, you can actually get much more output from the system and, and generate tremendous economic returns as well because what we've seen is that actually the performance of local retail along those streets that actually are easier to walk along, bike along, take transit along, are better for business. And you see retail sales soar when you actually are able to stop into the store and not have to circle for 15 minutes to find a parking space. So I think, again, it's really important uh, to look at our transit network as a critical component of the future of our cities because every city, every world-class city is investing in transit. And there's a reason for that because there's no better way to move people more effectively through that system as long as it's high quality, as long as it doesn't take 45 minutes, maybe if you're lucky, to get from point A to point B. And that's why I think looking at select bus service or other opportunities to really roll out the red carpet above ground, much as we've got below ground, is, a, is I think also a very uh, inexpensive way to provide that high-end mobility. So David, before we turn this up to questions, I'm ask you a couple things. I gather you've been meeting with the mayor here in the city. How's that going? <laughs> well, I learned a long time ago not to talk about uh, or meetings that may or may not have happened. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think generally, um, listen, I think there was a determination made by the mayor and, and the city council president and a few others to try and cap Uber. Uh, I didn't just follow up the turnoff truck. I've been in politics a very long time. And I think, um, you know, the taxi industry's contributed a lot of money. They see the growth of this industry and they wanted something done about it uh, because at first the whole rationale was congestion. Now it's not really about congestion. So uh, the president used to have a term when we were dealing sometimes with the congressional Republicans that the debate's not on the level. Right. And I think that's what's happening here. But it's a serious issue because if you come in and cap Uber and Lyft and other services, uh, it's also not gonna be a one-year cap. Who are you kidding me? You're basically gonna turn it into a medallion system. And what you're gonna see is the people in Bronx and Queens who now can get a ride in three minutes, that's gonna turn into eight, nine, 10. You're gonna have 10,000 less people driving. Prices are gonna go up. And again, we are, we are just part of the ecosystem now, but an important one. And if you degrade that in a serious way, and th this is a big degradation, 
uh, then that's going to become less reliable. Because at the end of the day, if you, w I think we all agree that given the migration into the cities around the world, you need less people using personal cars. We want them on subways, we want them on buses, we want them sharing vehicles, carpooling. Uh, this is going to really uh, harm that option. Uh, so, but we've had good discussions. I mean, uh, listen, uh, mayors generally don't lose city council votes. Uh, so we're an underdog here, but uh, we've got a lot of support on the council. I think this has been a healthy public debate. We're going to continue it over the next 48 hours. And, you know, we hope saner voices can. The truth is, we've, you know, again, we, this is the most regulated market in the, in the country for Uber. We actually have a good relationship with the TLC. Yeah. We want to continue that. The, the conversations we're eager to have is, okay, you've got some problems. How can we help solve them? Uh, that's what we're eager to do. I'm going to Chicago tonight. I'm going to spend two days in Chicago. That's what they want. How do we get more drivers on the platform? Can you help us uh, with job training programs? Those are the kind of discussions that we are eager to have. Thank you. Let me open this up to some questions before we finish. So, I, Charles? I think we have time for just one question. Um, ah. there, were, there were a number that came in um, saying to Jeanette, thank you for the uh, bike lanes. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. An equal number coming in. Apparently <laughs> people <so. laughs> um, <laughs> Th there, were, there were an equal number that came in asking, David, if you guys could stop the dynamic pricing when it starts <laughs> raining in New York. Um, <laughs> uh, less applause for that one. But the, the, the one question that came up a number of times was, if in fact we're looking at a future where there are less cars, where we're relying more on public transportation, and given that so much of the financing that exists currently for infrastructure comes from relying on people using cars, from taxes on gasoline and, t and other costs, how do we make sure that going forward that there is funding for infrastructure that isn't regressive, that doesn't unfairly fall on the people who most need public transportation and are least equipped to pay for increases in fares? Mr. Secretary? I think it's a very good question, and it, it depends on which level of government you're, you're focused on. I think at the federal level, uh, there's an active conversation about how we fund our infrastructure given the structural challenges of the gas tax, and um, there are some... Uh, economically viable alternatives, but they haven't become politically viable yet. And so I think we've got a, got a little gestation time on that question. Um, what I would say, though, is that um, uh, we've got to, at the state and local levels, um, the same basic structural problem at the state levels with fuel taxes. You're seeing, I think we have 18 states now that have raised uh, taxes, whether sales taxes or some other way to backfill some of the shortfalls they've been facing. And so I think there is a, an effort at the state level to diversify inputs into the system. Um, but I also think that as our system grows, we're going to have to continue uh, creating this, uh, this, or, this sort of uh, or, organic system that has a lot of ways that people can choose to move around. And uh, each of those ways will probably be funded a little differently. I would also add that, and this is you know, sort of my exclamation point on this, is that in the early 1980s, at the federal level, there was a deal cut to put 20% of the trust fund dollars into transit. And that has not moved. And with a country that's growing by 70 million people over the next 30 years, more people moving into metro areas, having a fixed amount that's going into transit at 20% is going to cap our ability as a country to be able to respond to these choices that people are going to want to make. And so this is a challenge that I think, this is why we need to sort of have a reset on transportation, I think, as a country. Our Grow America bill does uh, take us a long way towards moving things forward, but I, I think we've got a lot of discussion to have as a country at the federal level on this. And ju just one point on that is that Managing funding over the long term is also managing cost. Uh, and one, without being a magic one, advantage of uh, uh, P3s and public-public partnerships is you get certainty on costs for 30 years, which certainty on costs and certainty on service, on quality of service, meaning reinvestment, which is one of the issues mm -hmm. in the city today is because over 40 years, nobody has invested anything. Um, and so it's not about the initial capital expenditure, it's about maintaining it, upgrading it, uh, and, and keeping that level of service for the full duration of the contract, which makes a huge difference between just throwing money into an asset, not maintaining it, and in 30 years you've got zero, so you have to rebuild it from scratch. Mm -hmm. 30 years, actually, I'm doing 
generous as 15 yeah. years if you don't invest anything in it, it's worth nothing. Right. Thank you all very much. It's been uh, wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.